The majority of people who stutter try to conceal it in at least some situations. In this slideshow, I'll discuss the forms that such concealment can take, how and why it might develop, and what can be done to address it. I start with a brief review of published research on the topic, and will then discuss how the extent to which one tries to conceal a stutter can be influenced by one's beliefs about the nature of the condition and its probable impact on listeners. I'll consider the extent to which such beliefs are likely to be accurate, and the extent to which changes in such beliefs, both on an individual and societal level, have the potential to benefit people who stutter. So what is covert stuttering? Actually, the term covert stuttering is a bit problematic because covert stutterers in fact rarely stutter. Sometimes it's referred to as interiorized stammering or stuttering. For example, in Carolyn Cheeseman and Rachel Everard's book Stammering from the Inside Out. But that term also fails to capture its essence. Concealed stuttering or stuttering concealment may be a better option, inasmuch as its key attributes are the desire to conceal from other people the fact that one stutters, and the development of a sophisticated repertoire of avoidance strategies to, to, of avoidance strategies to conceal stuttering. In fact, the majority of people who stutter try to conceal it in at least some situations. Some of us may do so because we perceive, rightly or wrongly, that we would be penalised in some way if our stuttering was revealed. Others may do so because they consider it to reflect an undesirable weakness in their own personality. Either way, the desire to conceal stuttering constitutes a cognitive burden that may impair our ability to communicate and that may itself lead to an increased propensity to stutter. Arguably, the best way to reduce the desire to conceal stuttering is through research and education. Through research, because research has the capacity to clearly demonstrate that stuttering does not stem from any form of personal or moral inadequacy. And through education, because education is arguably the most efficient way of dispelling false beliefs. However, as long as stuttering continues to be portrayed and perceived by society, is indicative of a weak or ineffective personality, people who stutter will be continued uh, will continue to be motivated to conceal it. Ironically, it's the stutterers whose primary symptoms, such as blocks, repetitions and prolongations, are relatively mild who are most likely to develop covert stuttering. This is because mild stutterers are more easily able to hide their symptoms and are therefore more tempted to do so. And it's only stutterers with the mildest symptoms of all who are able and likely to try to hide their symptoms of stuttering entirely and, prevent and pretend that they don't stutter. Thus, paradoxically, one frequently finds that people whose visible, overt symptoms of stuttering are relatively mild suffer more from negative thoughts and feelings and low levels of self-esteem compared to those whose overt symptoms are relatively severe. Although covert stuttering is often considered by therapists and researchers to be distinct from overt stuttering, it's really more accurate to think of it as part of an overt-covert continuum. So, for example, although people with the most severe overt symptoms may understandably try to avoid speaking as much as possible, they rarely try to hide the fact that, that they stutter, simply because it's not possible to hide a severe stutter. Often people with moderate symptoms find that they're able to hide their stuttering from some people, but not others. So cons consequently, such people generally have a circle of family or close friends who know about it, but may nevertheless successfully manage to hide it from people that don't know them so well. At the other end of the spectrum are people whose overt symptoms are so mild that they manage to hide the fact that they stutter from everybody. Such individuals often suffer greatly as a result of having nobody that they feel able to confide in. 
Certainly most of us try to hide our stuttering to a certain extent, and to do so is perfectly understandable and not necessarily a bad thing. Arguably there are times when hiding it is the best thing to do, not least because some people or cultures associate stuttering with a weak character, dishonesty, personality disorders, possession by demons and things like that. And in such company, revealing yourself as a stutterer could put you at risk. Covert stuttering can be considered a disorder when we try to hide it to such an extent that our overall quality of life suffers as a result. In other words, our overall quality of life is worse than it would be if we didn't try to hide it. The prevalence of covert stuttering, that is of people who try to, condition, try to hide the condition more or less completely, is unknown. Cheeseman and Everard, who work in the city lit in London, have reported that a disproportionately large number of females attend therapy courses for covert stuttering. This could be interpreted as suggesting that it's more prevalent amongst women than men. However, it may simply reflect the fact that women are more likely than men to seek help. Whatever the case, the recent popularity of internet groups for covert stutterers suggests that the phenomenon may be substantially more common than generally thought. Probably it's more common in people who experience a strong need or desire to be socially accepted. And probably it's more common in individuals and societies who consider stuttering to be reflective of a weak or bad character. So how does the process of interiorization of stuttering begin? Well, in the beginning, when the symptoms of stuttering first start to arise, we're unable to anticipate that they will happen. And so invariably, our first stuttering is always overt. It's only when it starts to occur on a regular basis and starts to form a recognisable pattern that we become able to anticipate when and where it will happen and consequently we also learn how to avoid it. Covert stuttering could be considered as a secondary symptom or secondary manifestation of stuttering in as much as it develops in response to the primary symptoms. However, arguably, it's really a tertiary symptom in as much as trying to hide the fact that one stutters constitutes a further step which is beyond mere avoidance and escape behaviours. To clarify just how much of a problem concealment is, that is, how much of a problem trying to hide stuttering is, it's useful to consider it in relation to Sheehan's iceberg model of stuttering. A lot of the under-the-water stuff in Sheehan's iceberg can exist in people who are not covert stutterers. So covert stuttering could be considered to be more like a second iceberg that is even deeper than the first. So to sum up, we can consider the symptoms of stuttering to exist on up to three levels. The primary level consists of the inability to initiate or to move forward with articulation despite knowing exactly what one wants to say. The secondary level develops as we gradually accumulate negative experiences associated with stuttering and as a result of those negative experiences we start to fear it and to try to avoid it where possible. The third level of symptoms involves a development of the, of the desire to prevent people from finding out that we stutter and arranging our lives in such a way as to stop people from finding out. As mentioned previously, this third level is more likely to develop in people with relatively mild overt symptoms. Probably many severe stutterers would also try to hide it if they thought they could. However, the severity of their stutter means that they can't, except by being com completely mute, so they tend not to try to do so. There are two possible ways in which covert stutters can develop. 
In people whose overt stuttering symptoms have always been mild, in such individuals, interiorization is especially likely to happen if stuttering frequently evokes negative responses in listeners. Alternatively, interiorization may occur in people whose overt stuttering symptoms were previously severe but who are now experience appearing, uh, experiencing a period of remission. This may be especially likely to happen following therapy. At such times, because the overall severity of stuttering has decreased, it becomes much easier to hide the small amount of stuttering that remains, so the temptation to try to do so can be quite great. Furthermore, a common and completely understandable mistake people who stutter frequently make following apparently successful therapy is that they try to hide any evidence of subsequent relapse. For example, during the weeks and months following therapy, as they start to notice themselves starting to stutter again in certain situations, the temptation, more than ever, is to avoid those situations and pretend that the therapy has been more successful than is really the case. It's also quite possible that this process of interiorization following therapy may occur without our being consciously aware that it's happening. So often, following therapy, people who start to find themselves able to continue to produce far fewer overt symptoms of stuttering. However, their fear of producing such symptoms has actually increased. Essentially what has happened is that the proportion of the stuttering iceberg that is visible above the surface has decreased, but only because the iceberg as a whole has become somewhat more submerged. Overall, its size remains unchanged. I'm currently in the process of writing an account of how this once happened to me, so after reading this slideshow, check the website to see whether or not I've posted it yet. A number of prominent researchers and clinicians have argued that some forms of therapy actually promote interiorization of stuttering. For example, Joseph Sheehan made the following suggestion with regards to the increased fluency that results from fluency shaping and other techniques that only focus on the reduction of stuttered disfluencies without taking into account aspects of stuttering below the iceberg. He said, We suggest that the figures published on the establishment of fluency are mostly suppression figures and not ultimately recovery figures, and that the more successful a supp suppression, the less the chance of eventual recovery. The perspective the SSEP takes on this issue is that fluency shaping and other techniques that target the superficial symptoms of stuttering do have an important role to play in, th in stuttering therapy. However, it's vital that such techniques are also supplemented by other approaches that target the underlying psychological issues, as well as techniques that teach stutterers how to quickly get going again when they find that they've got stuck. As people who stutter, what can we do to address the problem of covert stuttering? Well, the first step, which hopefully this slideshow will have already helped you to make some progress towards, is to understand what it is and why it occurs. The second step is to identify whether or not you do it and to what extent it's harming you more than helping you. This is not as straightforward as it sounds, as each of us are subject to somewhat different social circumstances. If one lives in a country or society where people are routinely punished for stuttering, there may be many circumstances where hiding it is the most sensible thing to do. However, as long as we continue to hide our tendency to stutter, we'll be unable to reduce that tendency. Ultimately, if you want to progress, we need to live in a social setting where it's all right to stutter, even if this means moving to somewhere new. Often the biggest obstacles can be parents and extended family. 
So the third step is to explore and assess possible opportunities to stutter openly and also to talk about it with other people. If you live in a culture where such opportunities don't exist, you may find that the internet is the best place to start. There are several online groups that provide chat opportunities for people who stutter. And there are also a number of dedicated groups, especially for covert stutterers, and especially for female stutterers, should you happen to be female. Of course, there is a stuttering support. If, if there is a stuttering support group near, near you that meets regularly, and that you can attend, that may present an ideal opportunity. Whatever the case, formulate a plan of action. Create a hierarchy starting with the things that you can do that are safest and least likely to result in negative responses from other people. Meeting and talking with other stutterers is a good starting point if you have that opportunity. Then, as your confidence grows, Gradually allow yourself to stutter and perhaps talk about stuttering with more people, including some of the ones who may respond negatively. More often than not, when covert stutterers take these steps, they discover that most people are far more okay about it than, than they expected. It's likely that many of the people <coughs> that you think you've been successfully hiding it from already know that you stutter, but themselves never felt confident enough to talk it about it with you. That said, very few non-stutterers fully understand quite how serious a disability stuttering really is and how deeply it affects our lives and well-being. Tread carefully because not everyone's response will be supportive. <laughs>